Hello everyone, welcome back to Tales of High Strangeness. After a long hiatus, I'm back with some long-form Wendigo stories. In this episode, we dive deep into the heart of darkness with three harrowing tales of encounters with the Wendigo. Adapted from true events, reported by those who live to tell their stories. Each narrative has been carefully crafted, drawing from the eerie experiences of those who claim to have come face to face with this legendary creature. To protect the privacy of those involved, some names and details have been altered. Story 1 The night air was crisp and carried the scent of autumn leaves as Nicole navigated the winding roads leading to her small Georgian town. The dashboard clock glowed 1am, casting a pale light in the car as she spoke into the hands-free set connected to her phone. On the other end of the line, Ethan's voice was a comforting presence, a nightly ritual that ensured her safe arrival home. I'm on that curvy stretch now, almost there, Nicole said her eyes scanning the familiar yet isolated road bordered by thick forests. You know, I always get a bit on edge around here, especially this late, she continued, her voice a mix of fascination and unease. All the ghost stories I've grown up with, you'd think I'd be used to it by now. Ethan chuckled softly, his tone warm. Well, you've got me on the line, and I'm not going anywhere until I know you're safe inside, ghost stories or not. Nicole smiled, appreciating his reassurance. Thanks. It's just been a bit more real for me lately. After what happened the other night. I haven't really told you everything yet. There was a pause on the line as Ethan's voice grew serious. You know you can tell me anything, Nick. Whatever it is, we'll figure it out. Her gaze briefly met the rearview mirror half expecting to catch a glimpse of something otherworldly. But tonight, it was just the empty road and her car lights reflecting off the damp asphalt. I know I will. Let's just get me home first. As she rounded another bend, the headlights illuminated the edges of the dense woods, casting long shadows that danced across the road. Nicole's fascination with the paranormal had always been part of her, as natural as breathing. She could see what others couldn't, feel what they didn't. It was a gift, but in moments like this, as the darkness seemed to press in on all sides, it felt more like a burden. Just as she was about to change the subject, her eyes caught movement by the roadside. A figure, indistinct yet unmistakably large, loomed at the edge of her vision. Her heart skipped a beat as she slowed the car, straining her eyes against the darkness. Ethan's voice brought her back. Nick, are you still there? Everything okay? Just saw something. I'm not sure what it was, she replied, her voice tense as she gripped the steering wheel tighter. The road ahead was empty now, but the eerie feeling lingered a prelude to the harrowing encounter that awaited her just minutes up the road. Nicole's heart thudded painfully as the shape by the roadside moved into the full beam of her headlights. What she had taken for a large animal, perhaps a wolf, given its initial crouched posture, was startlingly different up close. The creature was hunched over, but as the car lights washed over it, it slowly rose to its full height standing unnervingly tall, at least seven or eight feet. The creature's eyes caught the light, reflecting a bright, unnatural glow that sent a chill down Nicole's spine. Its body was grotesquely humanoid, but covered in patches of fur that draped over its shoulders like a tattered cape. The sight was so bizarre, so otherworldly, that Nicole's first instinct was to question her own senses. I, Ethan, there's something out there, she stuttered, her voice barely above a whisper as she fumbled with the words. It looked like a wolf, but it stood up, almost human, wearing fur like a cape. I don't know, it's like something out of a horror movie. Ethan's concern was palpable, even through the phone. 
Just keep driving, Nick. Don't stop whatever you do. Nicole nodded, even though he couldn't see her. With shaky breath, she accelerated, the engine of her small car protesting as she urged it faster along the curvy road. She kept her eyes fixed ahead, resisting the urge to look back in her rearview mirror. Her mind raced, trying to make sense of what she had just seen. As Nicole continued to drive, her thoughts whirled with the implications of her encounter. The local legends, her own sensitivity to the supernatural, everything seemed to converge into a terrifying reality. But it was the abrupt sight of her own driveway that snapped her back to the present, a return to safety that was overshadowed by the night's eerie events. Pulling into the drive, her headlights swept across the yard, and for a moment, everything seemed normal, until a sudden movement caught her eye. From behind her father's car, a figure darted out, an entirely different creature from the one she had just seen on the road. It was ghastly pale, almost grey, its body emaciated, moving with an unnatural loping gait on all fours. In its hands, it clutched what looked unmistakably like a dead animal. Nicole's breath caught in her throat. The phone slipped slightly in her hand as she whispered, Ethan, there's something else here. Frozen in her car, Nicole gripped the steering wheel tightly as her breath came in short, sharp gasps. The headlights illuminated the grotesque figure of the grey man just for a moment before it disappeared into the darkness on the other side of her father's car. Its movements were jerky and unnatural, like a puppet being yanked by invisible strings. Ethan, Nicole managed to choke out, her voice trembling with fear. It's here, right here at the house, a walking corpse. It's carrying something. God, it looks like a dead animal. Ethan's voice was a lifeline in the swirling panic that threatened to overtake her. Nicole, listen to me. Stay in the car. Don't get out. Lock the doors. Nicole's hands fumbled for the lock button, pressing it down with a definitive click that echoed in the silent car. She could feel her heart pounding in her chest as she strained her eyes to pierce the darkness where the creature had vanished. Are you locked in? Are you safe? Ethan's words were calm, but she could hear the underlying strain. Yes, I'm locked in. I don't know what to do, Ethan. I'm scared to get out. I'm scared to stay here. Nicole's voice broke as she fought back tears the eerie stillness of the night pressing in on her from all sides. Just stay put for now. I'm here with you. We'll figure this out together, okay? Ethan's reassurance was steady, but Nicole could barely nod, her gaze fixed on the shadowy spaces between the trees, expecting the creature to reappear at any moment. Minutes stretched to an eternity as Nicole sat paralyzed with fear in her car, the only sounds were her uneven breathing and the soft patter of rain beginning to fall. She jumped when her phone beeped lowly, a reminder of the battery running low, adding another layer of anxiety to her already fraught nerves. Ethan, my phone's about to die, Nicole whispered, her voice barely audible. Okay, listen. I need you to make a run for the house as soon as you hang up. You can't stay in the car all night, do you hear me? Ethan's voice was firm now, insistent. Nicole swallowed hard, nodding to herself in the dark. Okay, I can do this. Right after we hang up, sprint to the door. It's not far. I'll stay on the line until you're inside. You're strong, Nicole, you can do this. Gathering every ounce of courage she possessed, Nicole prepared to end the call. She took several deep breaths, steadying herself for the dash to the front door. Her hand trembled as she held the phone, her eyes scanning the darkness for any sign of movement. Ready? On three, Ethan counted down. One, two, three. Nicole flung the car door open and ran with all her might toward the house, 
her heart screaming in her chest as she left the safety of her car behind. Nicole sprinted across the yard, the cold night air biting at her skin as her feet pounded the wet ground. Each step was fueled by a mix of adrenaline and sheer terror. The door seemed agonizingly far away, but she pushed herself, driven by Ethan's urging voice in her ear and the overwhelming need to feel safe again. As she reached the porch, her shaky hand fumbled with the keys, her breaths becoming ragged gasps. She could hear Ethan's voice, a steady stream of encouragement, but it sounded distant as her focus narrowed to the lock. With a trembling effort, she managed to insert the key and twist it, throwing the door open and stumbling inside. The moment the door slammed shut behind her, Nicole leaned back against it, her entire body shaking. She slid down to the floor, her phone still pressed to her ear, the screen now displaying the critical battery warning. I'm inside, she gasped out, her voice a mix of relief and lingering fear. I made it, Ethan. Thank God, came Ian's relieved reply, his voice thick with worry. Lock the door, Nicole. Make sure everything is secure. Nicole pushed herself up and quickly turned the deadbolt, her movements mechanical, driven by the instinct to fortify her sanctuary against the horrors outside. Once done, she checked the windows, making sure each was locked and curtained. Returning to the phone, Nicole sank onto the couch, her body still trembling from the ordeal. It's locked. Everything's locked. Ethan, what did I see? What were those things? Ethan was silent for a moment, the seriousness of the situation sinking in. I don't know, but it sounds like something out of those legends you've told me about. Skinwalker or maybe even a Wendigo, considering where you live. Nicole nodded slowly, her mind racing back to the stories she had read about the Wendigo. Creatures born from darkness and cannibalism, forever hungry, forever hunting. It could be, she whispered, her voice hoarse. The way it moved, the look of it, and the history of this area, it makes a horrible kind of sense. All Nicole wanted now was to feel normal again even if just for a moment. Stay on the phone with me until I fall asleep, she asked, a vulnerable edge to her voice. Of course, I'm here, Ethan assured her, his voice a comforting presence in the dark room. As Nicole curled up on the couch, charging phone clutched tightly in her hand, she listened to Ethan's steady breathing through the speaker. Despite the terror of the night, his presence, even from miles away, brought a semblance of peace. But as she closed her eyes, the images of the night's horrors lingered behind her lids. The morning after Nicole's harrowing encounter, the world outside seemed unchanged. The sun rose, casting light on the quiet, seemingly peaceful town. But the shadows of last night's terror still clung tightly to Nicole's thoughts. She spent the morning in a daze, her coffee untouched as she scrolled through online archives and local histories, seeking anything that might explain the sinister apparitions. Her search led her to numerous accounts and legends surrounding the local state park. The lore was rich with tales of betrayal and spectral sightings, which resonated deeply with Nicole, giving context to the fear that had gripped her. It wasn't just the landscape that was haunted, it was the history soaked into the soil she lived on. Feeling a mix of dread and determination, Nicole reached out to a local Native American cultural center. She explained her experiences, her voice still trembling from the memory. The person on the other end of the line listened intently, their response thoughtful. It sounds like you've encountered something that requires understanding beyond the usual, they said confirming Nicole's fears, but also offering a glimmer of hope. I recommend speaking with one of our elders. They hold the knowledge of our traditions and stories that can perhaps shed light on what you've seen. Grateful for the guidance, Nicole arranged to meet with the elder. Feeling a proactive step might help her reclaim some sense of control. 
The meeting was set for the following day at the Cultural Centre, located at the edge of the town near the forests that now seem so ominous. As she prepared for the meeting, Nicole reflected on her lifelong sensitivity to the paranormal. What had once been an intriguing gift was now a gateway to unseen dangers, revealing layers of the world she had never wished to uncover. Yet, the fear also kindled a new resolve in her. If these were indeed ancient spirits tied to the land, then understanding their origins and motives could be crucial, not just for her peace of mind, but for the safety of the community. The day of the meeting, Nicole arrived at the cultural centre, her notebook filled with questions and observations. The elder, a serene figure with deep knowing eyes, greeted her warmly. Over the course of several hours, they discussed the history of the land, the spirits that were said to roam it, and the significance of Nicole's experiences. The elder spoke of balance and respect, of acknowledging the past and its lingering presences. You've seen what many cannot, the elder told her, and with that sight comes responsibility. Learn from these encounters. Protect yourself, but also seek to understand. Our ancestors believed that awareness and respect could coexist with the spiritual world. Nicole left the meeting with a heavy but hopeful heart. The journey ahead would be fraught with challenges, but she was no longer in the dark. Armed with knowledge and the support of the Elder, she felt better equipped to face whatever the shadows might hold. And perhaps, in time, she would learn not just to fear the spirits, but to understand their stories. Story 2 Leon clipped the leash onto Baxter's collar, the metal clasp clicking sharply in the cool evening air. He opened the back door of the ground floor apartment, stepping out into the twilight that draped itself like a soft blanket over the suburban landscape. To the rear of the apartment complex where Leon and Baxter headed lay the thick woods, a sprawling dense barrier that marked the edge of civilization and beginning of wild, untamed nature. The path they took was well trodden, bordered by the occasional flicker of street lamps whose light barely penetrated the thickening darkness of the woods beyond. The evening was quiet, the usual bustle of the daytime now surrendered to the serene whispers of evening. A rustle of leaves, a distant bark, and the faint hum of the city that lay sprawled out not too far away. Baxter, a robust and normally serene dog, matched his steps with Leon, his head high and his ears perked, sniffing the air. The woods always seemed to bring out a different side of him, a more alert, more primitive side. Leon, with his hands tucked into his jacket pockets, felt the crisp air pinch his cheeks and welcomed the solitude that their nightly walks provided. As they moved closer to where the shadows grew thicker and the pass became less defined, Leon could feel the silence of the woods creeping towards them. It was here, on the edge of these dark woods, that the night seemed most alive, hiding secrets in its shadowy folds. Leon's thoughts were interrupted by a soft growling sound emanating from Baxter. It was a low, guttural noise that Leon had rarely heard from him. Startled, Leon halted, his hands tightening around the leash. Baxter's body was tense, his focus locked intently on a particularly dark section of the woods where the light failed to penetrate the dense thicket of trees. What is it, boy? Leon whispered, his voice barely a breath as he strained his eyes to see what had caught Baxter's attention. The usual nocturnal sound seemed to fall away, replaced by a thick, pressing silence that enveloped them. Baxter's growling grew louder more urgent, as if warning them of something unseen. Curiosity, mixed with a hint of fear, nudged Leon forward, pulling him towards the mystery hidden in the darkness. As he stepped closer, the outline of something, no, someone, began to materialize in the dim light. It was a figure, unnaturally tall and impossibly thin, 
standing eerily still among the trees. The silhouette seemed almost to blend into the woods, yet stood out starkly against the sparse light filtering through the branches. Leon squinted, trying to make sense of the sight. Its body was humanoid, gaunt, with limbs that twisted strangely, its tight skin clinging to its skeletal frame, and where its eyes should have been, there was nothing but deep, empty sockets that seemed to stare directly at him. A shiver ran down Leon's spine as he realized that what he was seeing matched the descriptions that he'd heard in hushed tones around campfires and in the back corners of local bars. Tales of a Wendigo, a creature of legend, gaunt and starved, that roamed the woods in search of unwary souls. Leon's heart pounded in his chest as he took a step back, his mind racing between rational explanations and the chilling realization that folklore might just be rooted in the horrifying truth. Baxter continued to growl, the hair on his back standing on end, his stance defensive, yet fearful. Leon's fascination with the paranormal had always been from a distance, through screens or pages of books. Now, confronted with the possibility of its reality, he felt a primal fear gripping him, urging him to flee. But his feet remained rooted, caught between the urge to escape and the eerie fascination with the spectral figure that seemed as curious about him as he was about it. In that moment of paralyzing stillness, Leon's thoughts raced as he tried to rationalize the sight before him. It's just a trick of the light, he muttered under his breath, a feeble attempt to calm his mounting dread. The stories of the Wendigo, once just eerie tales to chill the spine, now seemed terrifyingly plausible, as the creature's gaze felt piercing even from the empty sockets where its eyes should be. As Leon's eyes darted around, seeking some clue to prove this was just his imagination, the figure abruptly shifted. It moved with unnatural quickness, a mere blur of motion as it disappeared behind a tree. Leon's heart skipped a beat, his eyes widening in fear. When he dared to look again, the creature had reappeared now significantly closer, its presence unmistakably real and menacing. The proximity of the creature, the realization of its potential malevolence, ignited a primal surge of adrenaline in Leon. Fear was quickly laced with a defensive bravado born of desperation. He remembered an old piece of lore he had heard about such spirits the belief that a direct confrontation could ward off their evil intentions. Gathering his courage, Leon stood tall, his voice firm as he addressed the looming spectre. You can't follow me. You can't harm me, shouted Leon into the chilling breeze, his words ringing with conviction he barely felt. Go back to where you came from. The Wendigo remained motionless for a heartbeat, its head tilting slightly as if considering Leon's bold declaration. The night air hung heavy between them, its tension palpable. Baxter, sensing his owner's distress, issued a low warning growl, his body rigid and ready to defend. Leon's declaration seemed to hang in the air, a challenge thrown against the shadowy veil of the supernatural. He held his breath, waiting for the creature's response, hoping his words were enough to protect him and Baxter from the dark legend come to life. Leon, his heart racing, didn't wait to see if the creature would heed his command. Clutching Baxter's leash tightly, he turned and hurried back to the safety of the apartment, the gravel crunching under his feet as he sped away from the dark woods. Baxter, too, seemed eager to escape, his paws kicking up dirt as he kept his pace with Leon. They reached the apartment in what felt like seconds, the familiar yellow light from the windows now a beacon of safety. 
Leon fumbled at the door, his hands shaking as he struggled to fit the key into the lock. Once inside, he quickly slammed the door shut behind him, leaning against it as though he could physically bar the darkness from entering his home. The sudden noise startled Maria, Leon's girlfriend, who had been curled up with a book in the living room. She looked up, her expression turning from surprise to concern as she took in Leon's pale, distressed face. Baxter was just being weird, Leon managed to say. His voice strained as he tried to normalize the frantic entry. He didn't want to bring the terror indoors to make it real for Maria too. Must have been a raccoon or something, he added, hoping his shaky laugh sounded convincing. Maria eyed him skeptically, noticing how Baxter paced relentlessly by the door, occasionally whining and looking back at the darkened windows. She rose, her expression softening as she approached Leon, placing a hand gently on his arm. Are you okay? she asked, searching his face for the truth he wasn't saying. Leon forced a smile, nodding as he met her gaze. Yeah, I just got spooked by the shadows, I guess. Let's just, let's just keep the doors locked tonight, okay? Maria, still not entirely convinced but willing to let it go for the moment, agreed with a nod. Okay, let's get some rest. It's been a long day. As they prepared for bed, Leon's mind replayed the encounter. The vivid image of the Wendigo seared into his memory. He knew he hadn't imagined it, but for Maria's sake, and perhaps his own sanity, he chose to keep the chilling details to himself. He would keep watch over the shadows at the edge of the woods, silently hoping the creature was just a visitor passing through, never to return. Hours later, as the house lay silent in the deep of night, Leon found himself unable to sleep. His mind buzzed with the images of the evening's terror, each replay sending a fresh wave of chills down his spine. Unable to settle, he rose quietly from the bed, careful not to disturb Maria, who slept soundly, oblivious to the turmoil within him. He moved towards the window, peering out in the darkness that hugged their backyard. The woods seemed calm, almost inviting. Yet the stillness felt deceptive, hiding perhaps the very horror he had encountered. Driven by a mix of fear and insatiable need for answers, Leon decided he needed to know if the creature was still lurking out there. Slipping into his jacket and grabbing a flashlight, he quietly unlocked the door and stepped out into the night. The cold air hit him like a wave, and he shivered, not just from the chill, but also from the eerie quiet of the night. Leon's flashlight cut through the darkness, its beam flickering across the trees and bushes as he searched for any sign of the Wendigo. But there was nothing, only the gentle sway of the trees and the breeze and the distant call of a nocturnal bird. After several tense minutes scouring the tree line and finding no trace of the creature, Leon's shoulders slumped, both relieved and unnerved by its absence. Was it just his imagination? Had fear conjured up the beast from the fables he'd heard? Or had the creature retreated deep into the woods, back to wherever it had come from? With a heavy heart and a mind full of unanswered questions, Leon returned to the apartment, locking the door behind him with a definitive click. As he settled back into bed, the soft warmth of the room and the rhythmic breathing of Maria beside him offered little comfort. Lying in the dark, Leon's thoughts churned. He wrestled with the reality of his experience against the rational explanations his mind desperately tried to conjure. The balance tipped back and forth, logic against legend, until exhaustion finally claimed him. 
As dawn crept across the horizon, painting the sky with hues of orange and pink, Leon made a silent vow. He would keep the night's events to himself, a secret guard against the darkness at the edge of reason. But he would also keep watch, his eyes ever drawn to the shadowy boundary where their world met the wild woods, ready to protect his family from whatever might lurk beyond the known. Story 3 Rachel and Tom returned home just as the sun dipped below the horizon, its last rays disappearing behind the dense thicket of trees that bordered their property. Their boots thudded heavily on the wooden porch, shedding the dust and debris of a hard day's work in construction. As they entered the house, the familiar comfort of home welcomed them, the warm glow of lamps, the soft hum of a refrigerator, and the enthusiastic greetings of their three dogs. Dinner was quite a different affair. Both were too tired to engage in much conversation, focusing instead on the simple pleasure of a hot meal. Afterward, Rachel cleaned up while Tom went over the plans for the next day's project. His blueprints spread across the kitchen table. The routine was familiar and grounding, a necessary wind-down after the physical toll of their jobs. Once everything was set for the next day, they took the dogs out for a final walk around the property. The air was crisp filled with a scent of pine and the earthy musk of damp leaves. Night in the rural Pacific Northwest was profoundly dark. The sky, a velvety black canvas, sparkled with stars, unspoiled by city lights. The dogs, familiar with their evening circuit, needed little guidance as they roamed the perimeter of the yard, their forms occasionally visible by the light spilling from the house's windows. Back inside, the couple prepared for bed in a comfortable silence, a routine perfected over years of marriage. Tom cracked open the window in their bedroom to let in the fresh night air, a habit that Rachel had come to cherish, for it filled their room with the smells and the sounds of the forest. As they settled under the covers, the dogs found their usual spots on the floor each curling into a ball of fur. The soft patter of rain began to tap against the window, a soothing rhythmic sound that quickly lulled Tom into a deep sleep. Rachel, nestled against him, listened to the steady breathing of her husband and the distant rolls of thunder, feeling the peace of the moment seep into her bones. Tonight, like so many others, promised the deep, unyielding sleep of the utterly exhausted. But this night was different. As the world outside whispered and murmured in the throes of a typical northwest drizzle, something extraordinary and unsettling was about to intrude upon the sanctity of their home. Rachel's eyes snapped open, pulled from the depths of sleep by a sense of unease she couldn't immediately place. The room was dark, save for the faint glow of the moonlight filtering through the rain-speckled window. Beside her, Tom's steady breathing indicated he was still deep in sleep, undisturbed by whatever had roused her. The dogs, too, were silent, their forms just discernible in the dim light, completely at ease. The sound of the rain was gentle, a quiet tapping that was unusually soothing. But now it seemed like a backdrop of something more ominous. Rachel lay still, her senses heightened, straining to identify what had awakened her. And then she heard it, a voice, unmistakably Tom's, drifting through the half-open window. Babe, babe. Come out here and give me a hand with the boys. The confusion hit her like a wave. It was Tom's voice, but how could it be outside when he was clearly asleep beside her? Maybe she was dreaming, she thought. A bizarre, vivid dream where reality was twisted. But the voice came again. 
clearer and more insistent this time. Babe, babe, can you come out here and help me with the boys? Rachel's heart began to race as she sat up, the remnants of sleep rapidly falling away. She glanced at Tom, who remained undisturbed, his chest rising and falling rhythmically. The room was still in shadow, filled with the familiar shapes of their furniture, the quiet hum of the fan their only companion besides the rain. Gathering her courage, Rachel swung her legs out of bed and tiptoed to the window. The darkness outside was thick, the woods beyond their yard a black mass of unknowns. The voice sounded again, this time with a note of urgency that sent a shiver down her spine. Babe, come outside. It was Tom's voice, but there was something off about it. Something that didn't quite capture the warmth she knew. The demand was unlike him. Tom would have explained the problem, told her if something was wrong with one of the dogs. This voice, though mimicking his, was cold, commanding. Rachel peered through the glass, trying to make out any figures in the dark. But the outside floodlight, positioned on the opposite side of the house, cast all but the most distant trees in shadow, obscuring her view. Her mind raced. Could one of the dogs have gotten out? But no, they were all accounted for, sleeping soundly just a few feet away. Then... The realisation dawned chillingly clear. The voice was wrong. It wasn't coming from Tom. He was right here, breathing softly beside her. And if Tom was here, then who or what was calling to her from the dark? As Rachel stood frozen by the window, a chilling breeze whisked through the small gap carrying with it the moist, earthy scent of the rain-soaked forest. Her heart thudded painfully in her chest, her mind a whirl of fear and disbelief. She turned slowly, her eyes falling upon Tom, who lay undisturbed, his face calm in sleep. The voice came again, a sinister echo through the night. Babe, come outside. The terror that gripped her then was primal, a fear sharpened by the remembered tales of her youth, stories whispered by firelight about spirits in the woods, spirits like the Wendigo, who mimicked human voices to lure their prey into the darkness. Her father's voice, low and serious, seemed to echo in her ears recounting how the Wendigo would call out to the unwary, using the familiar and trusted voices of loved ones. With a trembling hand, Rachel reached out and touched Tom's cheek. His skin was warm under her fingers, his presence a stark contrast to the cold, disembodied voice that beckoned her from beyond the glass. The realisation that something unnatural was attempting to deceive her to draw her out with her husband's voice, crystallised in her mind, filling her with a horrified clarity. The room felt suddenly claustrophobic. The shadows seemed to lean closer, as if they too were listening to the voice that called her name. Rachel withdrew from the window, her back pressing against the cold wall as she slid down to the floor. Her eyes were wide, darting frantically around the room, half expecting to see some ghastly figure manifest from the shadows. She knew she should wake Tom, should tell him of the voice that wore his tone like a mask, but fear rooted her to the spot. Instead, she pulled her knees to her chest, wrapping her arms around them tightly, her entire body tensed against the terror that whispered from the outside. Babe, please come outside. Its voice was more insistent now, its cadence a perfect imitation of Tom's, yet 
carrying the coldness that was far from anything human. Rachel squeezed her eyes shut, forcing herself to block out the calls to ignore the chilling invitation. Her mind raced. Was it the Wendigo? Or was it merely her own imagination, fueled by the ghost stories of her childhood and the isolation of their wooded home? No matter the answer, Rachel knew she could not heed the call. With every fibre of her being, she resisted the urge to look at the window again, to seek out the source of the voice. Instead, she remained huddled on the floor, waiting for the dawn, for the light to banish the darkness and the voice that so desperately wanted her to step into the night. Eventually, Rachel's trembling subsided enough for her to peel herself from the floor. With cautious, silent steps, she returned to the bed, her gaze fixed on the window, half expecting the voice to ring out again. But as she slipped under the blankets, the night remained silent except for the soft patter of rain and the comforting hum of the fan. Lying down, she inched closer to Tom as possible without waking him. Her body pressed against his. She sought not just the warmth of his skin, but the reassurance of his real, tangible presence. As she lay there, her mind spun with terrifying implications of what she'd heard. Her father's stories no longer felt like distant tales meant to spook her. They felt like dire warnings. The voice called out to her once more, a clear, pleading beacon. Babe, please, come outside. Rachel clenched her eyes shut, squeezing the words out of her consciousness. She focused on the rise and fall of Tom's chest, the sound of his breathing, anything to anchor her to the reality that he was right there beside her. She told herself it was just a trick, a sleep-induced hallucination perhaps, or a wind-whipped distortion of sounds that the forest so often created. Yet the voice persisted, each call slicing through the night with more urgency. Rachel, come out here now. This was the first time the voice used her name, and it struck a new chord of fear in her heart. Her breath hitched in her throat, and she fought the overwhelming urge to respond. Instead, she buried her face against Tom's back, her hands gripping the fabric of his shirt. She willed herself to believe it wasn't real, that the voice was just a fragment of a nightmare bleeding into wakefulness. As the hours dragged on, the intervals between the calls grew longer, until they ceased altogether. The rain continued to tap rhythmically against the window, a natural sound that slowly reclaimed the night from the eerie disruption. Rachel's eyes remained tightly shut, her body rigid as she lay there, praying for the morning to come quickly. The darkness gradually waned, the first hints of dawn creeping around the curtains. The normalcy of the light brought a cautious relief. Rachel loosened her grip on Tom's shirt, her body finally relaxing as the terror of the night began to ebb away, replaced by an exhausted vulnerability. She had survived the night. The voice had gone, but the fear of what it had been and what it wanted lingered in her mind like the echo of a bad dream. As the first light of dawn filtered through the curtains, casting a soft glow that gradually filled the room, Rachel finally allowed her eyes to open. The terror of the night had obeyed, and in the comforting light of the morning, the fearsome echoes of the voice seemed almost unreal. She lay there for a moment, watching the dust motes dance in the beams of sunlight feeling the solidarity of Tom's presence beside her. Slowly, she untangled herself from the blankets and got out of bed. She made her way to the kitchen, started the coffee maker, and stood by the window, peering out at the serene landscapes that showed no signs of nocturnal disturbances. Tom soon joined her, 
His face crinkled with sleep and concern as he noticed the pallor of her skin and the dark circles under her eyes. Oh my God, you look like death, he commented, half joking as he wrapped an arm around her shoulders. Rachel managed a weak smile, leaning into his embrace for a moment before she recounted the events of the night. She told him about the voice, how it mimicked his tone, calling out to her in the darkness. Tom listened, his brow furrowing in confusion and skepticism. It was probably just a creepy sleepwalking thing, he concluded, brushing off her fears with a casual laugh. You know how you get those. But Rachel shook her head, her expression solemn. No, Tom, I was awake. I didn't move from the bed. It wasn't like the other times. This was different. Real. Tom looked at her, seeing the genuine fear in her eyes, and his demeanor softened. Okay, babe, he said not wanting to dismiss her concerns outright. We'll keep the windows closed at night from now on, all right? Maybe check around the property later, just in case. Rachel nodded, appreciative of his efforts to comfort her. Yet, the unease remained, a shadow that lingered in the back of her mind. She knew what she had heard, and the terror wasn't just a fragment of her imagination. It was as real as the daylight that now bathed their kitchen in warmth. As they moved through their morning routine, the normalcy of the day did little to erase the dread that had settled over Rachel. Every sound seemed sharper, every shadow darker. She couldn't shake the feeling that something had reached out to her from the forest. Something ancient and malevolent. And it knew her name. The knowledge that the voice could return, perhaps in another guise, another tone, kept her vigilant, watching the woods with wary eyes. She kept her fears to herself after that, unwilling to disturb the peace of their life with the tales that sounded like they belonged around a campfire. But as she walked the docks or tended to the chores outside, Rachel's gaze often drifted to the tree line to the dark places where light seemed reluctant to reach. And she listened, always listened, for the voice that had called her into the night, hoping to never hear it again.